Hey everybody and welcome to a new season of Board Game Heaven. In this first episode of 2019, I'm going to talk about Jim Henson's The Dark Crystal, the board game by River Horse Games. I'd like to thank River Horse for providing me with this review copy. And this is a game for two to four players where you competitively or in teams uh, try to restore the Dark Crystal, just like in the movie. Now, if you're a fan of the movie, you already know the characters. And um, if you don't, well, it's a fantasy game. Uh, where in a strange land two Gelflings try to restore a dark crystal that has cast a shadow over the land and these evil Skeksis are trying to prevent that so they can rule the world. So let's open up the box, see what's inside, I'll set up a game and explain the rules and then I'll tell you what I think about it. So Jim Henson's The Dark Crystal The Board Game so the box is lovely illustrated with some cool uh, movie poster art on the front. The cool font that is also used in the movie is big on the front of the box with the four main characters of the movie that are also in here as miniatures uh, depicted here. Uh, one of the cards slid in front of the miniatures here uh, in shipping. So I'll open that up and show them to you properly, of course. So the back of the box has an image of what you can find inside. So here's the game board, the standees, the miniatures, uh, lots of cards um, and some extras as well as you can see here, some tokens and some dice. It has a bit of story and it lists the game components as well. So it's a game of ages 14 and up, two to four players, which plays in about an hour. Let's open up the box. So there we go, here is the box, here is the card that slid away, so here we can see the way it is properly organized in this nice uh, insert which has a very soft felt touch and inside you will find uh, a clip that uh, is used for one of the game components which we will see later. We've got the four characters that have miniatures as well. We have Skexil, the Chamberlain. Let me just focus here. So here he is. And he's got uh, a speed, wit and brawn over here, which uh, are rolled by different dice depicted by these colors. And we also have on the back, it just says the Dark Crystal and a nice logo. We have Skekung, the Gartham Master. Also with his stats over here, nice artwork. We have, of course, the hero Gelfling Jen with Speed, Wit and Brawn over there. And finally, Kira, the Lady Gelfling, who helps Jen on his quest to restore the Dark Crystal. All of them have really lovely art on the cards and they are made of a rather thick uh, cardboard, so that is nice. We have some uh, stands over here, some plastic stands that are used with the standees that come with this game. We have very colorful uh, different kinds of polyhedral dice. So just like with Labyrinth the board game, uh, we have a green d6 we have a yellow D8, a red D4, a purple D10, a black D12, and a blue D20. We have a pack of cards, and that has one of those pulling things over here, which greatly helps. <laughs> So let's see, we've got cards here and they have some nice artwork on the back of the different characters. So there's one for each character. And I'm assuming this is a special ability that you can use during the game. 
Then there is plenty of these cards. Let's see, there's different ones. We have these. And they have some scenes from the game. And murky waters, creeping vines. So all kinds of things that you will recognize if you've seen the movie. And if you haven't seen the movie, I strongly, strongly suggest you do because it is a beautiful movie. One of my childhood favorites, along with Labyrinth, which I also loved. So, all these crazy creatures from the movie. So we have those cards, then we have these cards. Let's see what those are. So we have some different Skeksis. Skektek, the scientist. Skekzok, the ritual, ritual master. Skekayuk, the gourmand. Skekna, the slave master. Skekshot, the treasurer. Skekok, the scroll keeper. Skekekt, the ornamentalist. So, different Skeksis there. The bad guys of the movie. As you may have gathered, Here's Ursul, the chanter, Urim, the healer, Urza, the ritual guardian, Urut, the weaver, Uramaj, the cook, Uryod, the numerologist, Urnal, the herbalist, Urak, the scribe, and Urti, Ur the alchemist. So these are the, uh, the elders which raised uh, Jen and the good guys of the movie. And here are some of these monster cards. So, all kinds of different enemies. We have crystal bats. We have ah. <laughs> we have a feed on slave, Gartham. Lots of those dangerous big crab-like monsters. Minion surge. There they are again. So these are events that will happen during the game. I gather. So, let us have a look at these miniatures then. So here is Skexil, I think. And as you can see, if I can get a focus on that a little bit better. This is a highly detailed miniature. It's nice and big. Look at all that, all the rags and all the stuff they have in their cloaks. With their bird-like faces. Vultures, more or less. So that's the first one on this uh, nice base. Here is the second one. Who was that? Skekung, I think. Although this might be Skeksil as well. He's not holding a sword, so it's hard to tell who is who. But this does have armor on him, so I'm guessing this is Skekung. Okay, so also a very highly detailed... Skex's miniature here. Lots of layers of, of plating that he's wearing. Very cool looking. So it's pretty exciting to have some of those cool characters from one of my favorite movies from my childhood uh, being made into miniatures like this. That's pretty awesome. So here's Kira. No, that's... Um, Ah, uh, what's the lady called again? And that, that is Kira. Yeah, I was right. <laughs> and uh, she has Fizzigig, her little doggy creature with her as well. Look at that. She's holding him. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Wearing her cloak. So that's nice. And here is Jen, the hero, the Gelfling. There he is, also nicely detailed, holding the shard, the crystal shard that needs to be placed into the dark crystal to restore its power. Okay, so those are the four miniatures. Then underneath the insert, we have a couple of leaflets. So that is pretty cool. An Anniversary Edition Blu-ray. So that comes with the game as well. Here is the manual, the rule book. 
that has a bit of a, a text here, an introduction. The components are listed. Some cool uh, shots from the movie. And the rules, of course. This setup. Game turn overview. Willpower having a go. Moving. Minions and attacking. There we are. Some lovely artwork. So that's the rule book. And of course, finally, the board. Oh, and some tokens as well. Let me show you these these punch boards first because they have all these cool uh, monsters, these minions, and some of these poor little slaves that are drained of their life by the evil Skeksis over here. So some extra Skeksis there. Some of these uh, monsters, these crab-like monsters. And these tokens, and they are all double-sided. Oh, and they punch very easily. <laughs> and here is another punch board with one of these elders, Fizzgig, uh, a staff, a piece of the crystal, and a time track. So I'll put that together and show that to you in a bit. And there, there is the board, which is lovely illustrated just like uh, Jim Henson's Labyrinth, the board game, also had. So there you go. A rather large board with spaces where the cards go and the Skeksis keep in the middle here, the crystal keep. And it has all these rooms inside where all kinds of stuff happens. All right, let's set up a game and then I'll explain how to play it. The setup for Jim Henson's The Dark Crystal is as follows. You place the board on the table and you put the Gartham soldiers over there on this spot. You put uh, Jen over there in the round starting spot in his village. Kira starts in the wilderness over here and the Duskexes start at the moat and the throne room. Their starting position is determined by a, a ritual called the trial by stone. Basically what they do is they fight each other by rolling the d12 and the person who rolls the highest number wins and the loser loses one uh, willpower token which are these tokens and that player starts at the moat and the winner starts in the throne room and takes the scepter indicating that he is the emperor. Uh, play uh, order is always as follows. It's always first Skeksil, the Chamberlain, Jen, then Skekung, the Garth Master, and Kira. So make sure you all sit in the table in that order, which makes it easier. You place the Ori somewhere on the table, starting at number 19. If you want to make it easier, you can go up uh, higher, 20, 21, etc. Or if you want to make it hard, you can start at lower. But 19 is uh, the, the starting number according to the rule book. Um, then you place all these different decks of cards on the table uh, after you shuffle them. There's the world deck, which has uh, places that take place in the, in the world. When, when the, um, the Gelflings land on one of those spots, they draw a card and they do what it says. You have these minion cards, which basically control the Gartham. And you have some extra cards with extra Skeksis uh, allies and extra Mystic allies. And these are for the, uh, the Gelflings. So you place those on the table. Then every player has their own cards and it has a willpower track. And in this case, Kira's willpower goes all the way up to six, and she starts out with four willpower tokens. So you give that to each player. And Kira also starts out with the Fizzgig token, which is her little doggy companion. Then each player takes their own character card, which basically gives you a one-time advantage. You can discard that card to roll a d20 for a certain skill test. 
Skeksil always starts, so he gets the uh, starting player token, and that's basically the turn token, so you pass it on uh, to indicate whose turn it is. Sometimes other players have to do things during another player's turn, and you can lose track of whose turn it is, so that token helps to remind you of that. And there's also the uh, Crystal Shard token, which you keep somewhere on the table, and you will get that later on in the game. And the rest of the willpower tokens are simply kept here. There's a couple of standees here, which you will only use in the end of the game, once everybody enters the Crystal Palace. Now, the Crystal Palace has a couple of rooms I will show you in the booklet. So, it has the moat, which is the square uh, spot uh, at the bottom. The other ones are the shape of the card, they're re rectangular. Then there is the slave quarters, the banquet hall, the throne room and the crystal chamber. And they are connected like that, like a spiral. So once you go in, you start out here first, then there, then there, and then in the crystal chamber. And the emperor who starts in the throne room, if he wants to go outside, has to go through the banquet hall, the slave chambers, into the moat. The dungeon is where the Gelflings go when they are defeated. When they lose are their, their willpower, they start out there with just one willpower back. And this is the Gartham Nest. Every time you defeat a Gartham, it ends up here and then it will start out anywhere that the cards tell them to or where the uh, Skeksis take them. So the Chamberlain goes, then Jen, then Skekung, and then Kira. And after all four players have played, you rotate the orrery one spot down. And that's basically the entire setup. Let's explain the rules. Okay, so on a player's turn, you do several things. The Gelflings always move first, and then if they land on one of these rectangular spots, they draw a world card. They put it on that spot and resolve its effect. The Skeksis players always draw a minion card first before they do anything else. They resolve that card and then they can move. Instead of moving, all players can also decide to rest. If they decide to rest, then your turn is over, so you can't move or attack enemies in the space or draw a world card if you're uh, one of the Gelflings. But you gain a will point, willpower token. If the Gelflings are in a space together and one of them decides to rest, then you can also um, give a willpower token to the other player if you want to. Moving works as follows. You simply check your character sheet and all of them have different stats on them, as you can see over here. So uh, Kira here has a speed uh, that you determine by rolling a d8, which is the yellow die. Wit, which is used for battling or, you know, checking uh, whether you're smarter than the others during a, an event. Then you roll a d8 as well. And for Brawn, she rolls a d6. Now, as long as she has Fizzgig, though, she also rolls a d8 for that. So all the characters have different statistics, meaning they roll different dice for different things. The Gartham always roll Brawn with a d12. They have no wit and their speed is only a d4, so they're the slowest. You can always choose to roll a lower die to move than that is on your card. So if you want to reach some of the empty spots that don't have cards yet, uh, uh, being a, uh, a Gelfling, then you can say, well, okay, normally I'd roll a d8 and I'd probably get too far. I can roll a d4 instead and try to reach one of the closer um, spots. If the Gelflings are in the same space and they want to move together, then you always roll the speed die of the slowest character, but they both have d8 speed, so that doesn't matter in their case. Uh, in the case of the, um, the Skeksis, they can bring along one of the Gartham. So if they are in the same spot as a Gartham and they want to move together, want to bring one of them along because they're good at fighting, then they have to roll the d4 for movement, because these guys are really slow and they can't keep up. So you always have to roll the slowest die. Whenever the Gelflings, as I said, land on an empty spot, they draw a world card. 
So let's explain one of these world cards. So in this case, it says creeping vines, test speed versus a d4. So basically somebody rolls a d4, uh, the Gelfling rolls his uh, speed die, which in Jen's case is uh, the d8, uh, Kira as well. So they roll a d8 and the higher result wins. So if you roll a success, you leave this card on this spot. That means that spot will always have the creeping vines and every time they land on it, they have to roll it. The Skeksis ignore any world cards, they just move through the world unhindered. So, and then if they fail, you have to lose two of your willpower tokens and you also leave this card in that space. And there's all kinds of different things happening in the world. Most of them are negative, mind you. So the goal is to finally reach um, Agra's orrery, so Agra's laboratory, there's a place in the world where the crystal shard is hidden. And they need that crystal shard to get into the castle and to repair the dark crystal over there. And that card is hidden in the bottom of the deck, in the lowest six cards of the pile, because that's something I forgot to mention in the setup. You take the um, Augur's Observatory card here, that's where the Crystal Shard is, and you put that apart, then you shuffle uh, your deck, and you take six cards out, and you put this one, you put that one in and you shuffle that, and you put those at the bottom of the world deck. So somewhere in the last six cards there will be Agra's observatory and then you will find the card. So basically what the Gelflings have to do is travel around as much as they can finding empty spots to put a card in then hopefully defeat that test, win that test uh, otherwise they lose willpower uh, so they get weaker and weaker as you go and every time every one taking a turn this number goes down so they have to hurry and find that final card. So they have to go through the world quickly, get more cards on the table. So that's basically their challenge, and then they have to take the crystal shard and take it to the uh, crystal, the dark crystal in the castle. So moving separately might help uh, getting through the deck quicker, although if they move together, they're stronger, and both players will still get to place cards. So, but you know, if they're at different parts of the board, that might help and maybe later they could team up and try to reach those final uh, empty spots and, you know, find that shard. Now the Skeksis, of course, want to prevent that, so they move around trying to find the Skeks, uh, the Gelflings, and fight them using their brawn or wit. And they can take along the, um, these Gartham, and when they use them to fight, they only use brawn. So, for example, if here the uh, Chamberlain has a Gartham with him and he manages to uh, reach and he has to roll a d4 of course because of the slow uh, movement of the Gartham and he rolls a 1 then he could move into the Gelfling's spot and then they would battle so the um, they had they would have to use brawn and the um, the Chamberlain's uh, brawn is the d8 and the Gartham's brawn is the d12 so they roll both those and the highest that number counts, and then the Gelfling tries to uh, tries to win using Brawn, but in this case, even with Fizzgig, it's D8, so she's not going to roll an 11 on a D8, so she's automatically going to lose, and that means she loses a willpower. So that's basically what the uh, Skeksis do, and at the start of each of their turns, they draw one of these minion cards, and they say, hey, there's a minion surge or something else happening. And this is a mean card because this says, take a Gartham anywhere, roll a d4 to move it. So you could take one of those and just start moving it. And if they land on the enemy, uh, on the enemy Skeksis, because they are, you know, they're not friends, they battle each other as well, but also the Gelflings, then you attack with a d12. And after that's done, you draw another minion card and resolve it. So these go onto the bottom of the deck every time. And then you draw another one. And this one says Crystal Bats. These are kind of the spies of the Skeksis. And they can pick any world space. And if there's a Gelfling there, then the bats attack them. And sometimes they're spotted. So the bats will send in a Gartham instead. So yeah, that's all pretty nasty. And doing so, the Skeksis will try 
to uh, you know get to slow down the gelflings and you know make them lose uh, willpower. And whenever a Skeksis defeats a Gelfling, so it takes away its last willpower, it goes to the uh, prison over here, the prison cells, and it's put down to indicate that it's knocked out. If a world event causes uh, one of the Gelflings to uh, be knocked out, to lose its last willpower, it's knocked out in this uh, mystic village. Now, every time you're knocked out, you lose all your special ability cards, even the ones that you start out with so that is not a good thing because this these cards usually always give you a d20 to roll for a certain event so you can use a d20 instead of a brawn or a wit or a speed test or whatever it says on the card so those are really good to have and then on the gelflings next turn they have to rest because they're knocked out they can't move so they're stood up and they gain one willpower there's also a rule about resting in the Valley of Stones over here in the uh, Mystic Village. If you rest there, you're stood back up and you gain back all of your willpower tokens. And you fill up your, uh, your card completely, so that's even more than your starting willpower. So that is an advantage of resting over there. Now, Jen, uh, having been, been he's, he is from the Valley of Stones, uh, has, having been there, knows where to find it but Kira doesn't at the start of the game because she lives in the wild uh, she can only go there uh, after she's either been defeated by a world event she automatically rests there because the mystics found her and took her back to the village or she can go there on her own accord after she's teamed up with Jen and they both together moved there once before if a Skeksis is knocked out by the Gelflings then it's placed lying down in a throne room, which is over here. And they also lose all their special ability cards that they currently have. If the other Skeksis just happens to be there, that does not trigger an attack because it's already knocked out. And the other one can't attack because he is knocked out. And on the next turn, they also have to rest. And they also get all their willpower back, filling up their full card with four uh, willpower tokens. Now, every time somebody rests in their, their home spot, so when the uh, Gelflings rest in the Valley of Stones or the Skex is in the throne room, then all players get one of these cards. So the Skexes, they get these Skexes cards, which is basically a reinforcement. It's a different Skexes that will stay with you, an ally, and you can use him uh, for a brawn or a wit test. And then the card is discarded. And uh, likewise, the uh, Gelflings, they get these Mystics that will help them, and they can also be used for, in this case, a Brawn and a Wit test. Now keep in mind that only the resting player gets the Skeksis card, if it's a Skeksis, and the Gelfling gets the Gelfling card. And the opposing team, there's also one who gets the card. Now for the Skeksis that's always the Emperor, so the one with the with the wand. And for the, um, the Gelflings they get to decide which one draws one of these cards. If a Gartham soldier is knocked out they only have one willpower so they're immediately defeated and they go back to the nest. Note that when a Skeksis enters a space with a Gelfling they always attack. This also goes for the Gelflings. If a Gelfling enters a space or ends its movement in this spot where there is a, a, a Skeksis and maybe even a Garthen, they also must do battle. If the Skeksis land on a space with another Skeksis, then they also do battle because, as I said, they're not friends and the one that moved attacks the one that was already there. And any Garthen that the moving Skeksis took along is on its side and will help in the attack of the other Skeksis. Now, like I said, battle can be done with Brawn or Wit in, instead of the, except for the uh, Gartham, because they only have Brawn, they have no Wit. And you can choose, if you're the attacking player, what to use. So also check out the enemy's card to see if your Wit or your Brawn is higher than theirs. Now, during a fight, you can always spend one of your uh, willpower tokens to re-roll a bad roll. So let's say you rolled badly 
and you really need to win this time, you could choose to spend one of your willpower, and then you take the blue d20 and re-roll. So if you roll a lot higher then, then you win, of course. But keep in mind that the enemy can do the same. So if the enemy also has some willpower to spend, they can also spend one next and then roll the d20 again. And that can go on as long as people are willing to sacrifice willpower tokens. If a Skeksis is fighting both Gelflings, so let's say for example over here, and these two come over here, and they win at a battle of wit, then they can choose to waylay the Gelflings and send them both running in different directions by one spot. But keep in mind that that does not trigger any world effect. So if there was a card here, then that would be ignored. There is an advantage uh, to having this Emperor uh, Scepter when you're playing one of the Skexes. And one of those is that you decide uh, what Gartham to move where when a minion card dictates to move a Gartham. But the Emperor always draws two cards instead of one and then decides which one to keep and the other card is discarded. The Gelflings have the Fizzgeek token, like I said earlier, which gives Kira an, a higher brawn value. Now, if both Gelflings are together, and in this case Kira gets knocked out, then Fizzgeek will move to the other uh, Gelfling uh, that is still uh, walking around and will stay there until that one gets knocked out as well. And then uh, Jin gets a, an improved brawn roll. The same basically goes for the Crystal Shard. If the Crystal Shard is found and one of the players has it, let's say Kira found it, and she gets knocked out, then she drops the shard and Jen, if, she's, if he's with her, will automatically pick it up and take it with him. Now, if she has the Crystal Shard and Jen is not with her and she's defeated by the Skeksis, then she drops the Crystal Shard, the Skeksis take it, and then the Skeksis player with the Scepter wins the game. Defeated Gartham can also be used to move around and they just spawn back in the nest and they will move and when they move out they don't have to go through the entire castle because the Gartham nest is considered to be next to the moat. So that's just one spot. If a Gelfling was defeated by the uh, Skeksis and is caught in the, uh, the prison and they have to rest on their next turn to be stood up and gain a will point, then on the turn after that they can try to move out of the prison. And there's a special rule for that. If they want to try to move while in the prison they need to break free and you do need to do a speed test using a d8 against a d6. If that test fails you can't move out but you can instead still rest and get a, a willpower token. But if you pass the test, then you and possibly another Gelfling that is with you, if you're in a group, then you move out as normal, using the result of the speed test as your movement roll, and then the moat is also the first space that you move on. Now at the end of the game, the only way to enter the, the Crystal Castle is for the Gelflings to have the Crystal Shard, otherwise they cannot enter. So when the Gelfling, or both of them, uh, take the Crystal Shard and they get to the moat, then the first spot they move into is the Slave Quarters. And then their go immediately ends and the end game begins. Now, when that happens, if the other Gelfling is not already moving in a group with the Gelfling with the Shard, then the Gelfling automatically joins you there, even if it was in the dungeon. Then when that happens, both uh, Skeksis are moved to the Crystal Chamber, then if these Skeksis have any Skeksis cards on their character sheets, they must discard them all at that point. It's every Skeksis for himself. Then you remove the standees from the uh, Gartham because they no longer play a role. And you take these standees and here are the slave podlings. And there's also the, uh, the gourmand who resides in the kitchen, the dining chamber. And there is the slave master and you place them in the castle. And then at the end of the Gelfling's turn, who just moved in there and everybody, everything's set up, they have to immediately battle these, these podlings, which are basically 
uh, poor little slaves kept by these Kexes to drain them of their life force. So in the slave quarters, the first challenge is against these podlings, and they have to test speed against a D8. That's it. That's the first challenge. If they fail that, they need to test drawn versus a D4, a D6, and a D8. But you can also roll your dice as a group. If you pass, then you kind of sneaked past them, and you have to test wit versus a D6 and a D4. If the Gelflings manage to do that, they get into the banquet hall and face the gourmand. And you can continue uh, testing. So you could, you could potentially go through all of them if you're really good at rolling. Otherwise, it will take a turn. So in the banquet hall, you need to first do a speed test against a D10. If you fail, you draw two Skeksis cards and they fight you as a group. And if you pass, then you draw one Skeksis card. Then they go into the throne room over there. And they have to test their speed against a D12. So first a D8, then a D10, then a D12. And if they fail, they draw three Skeksis cards and they fight you. And if you pass, you draw two Skeksis cards. So it gets increasingly harder and harder to go through those rooms. And then finally, they enter the crystal chamber over there in the middle of the castle, trying to put the, the crystal shard into the dark crystal. And then they must attack the Skeksis in the chamber. If there are still two Skeksis left, because they fight each other on their turns uh, while uh, the, the, the Gelflings are fighting through the castle, so if they're both still there, then they put aside their differences and they fight as a group against the Gelflings. The Gelflings lose, they lose one uh, willpower each, and they must stay here to attack the Skeksis in their next go. But if they win, then they finally put the shard into the Dark Crystal and they restore peace to the world and they both win the game. Now, if all of that uh, doesn't work and they lose, then the Skeksis win, but only the one who currently holds the scepter and is the Emperor. Now, if you're playing this game with less than four players, if you're playing with three players, then one player controls both the Gelflings. And if you're only playing two players, then one player plays both Gelflings and one player plays both Skeksis. Okay, so that was the Dark Crystal. I'll share my final thoughts on the game with you. So, as you've noticed, there is a lot of dice rolling going on. It's just like Jim Henson's Labyrinth, the board game. You move around the world, and where that was a cooperative game, in this game there's only two people playing cooperatively, and the other ones are just fighting to win the game themselves, which puts a twist to the game, but basically it plays exactly the same as Labyrinth. So it's a dice fest. There's a lot of dice rolling, there's a lot of luck involved, and it's the luck of the draw. You never know what card you're gonna draw and when you will find uh, Augur's Laboratory in the end with the shard, and if you even make it that far, because, you know, 19 turns, uh, I found that that is a bit on the short side. Usually we just or just don't make it to the castle and then you have to fight all these guys and they will drain you of your willpower rather quickly. So that is really, really tough to win for the Gelflings. And you can make it easier by increasing, uh, like I said, the number of turns. But in the end, it's still a luck fest and it's still rolling dice. So in that regard, there's not a whole lot of strategy or gameplay here. I think this game is fun to play with with younger people, you know, with kids, if they're old enough to understand how the game works. But with just adults, I don't know, it's probably going to get boring fast. And if you're playing with four players, playing 19 turns, it may drag a bit and overstay its welcome. So, having said that, uh, there's also... Another, yeah, minus, I have to say, is all the rules. I mean, the rule book is rather thick for the kind of game that is. I mean, it's a simple game. You roll dice and you draw cards and you do what it says and that's it. But there are so many 
ifs and buts. And there's, you know, moving together, which is relatively easy to remember. You roll the slowest person's die, and in these guys' uh, case, it's uh, the d4. But there's also, you know, you can split up only if you win with wit at playing the Skeksis. You can split up the, the, the Gelflings. And you can use the willpower to roll the d20. So that's, that's clear enough. But, you know, once you're defeated by the Skeksis and you end up over here in the prison, then there's a rule for, you know, getting out. Then you need to roll a speed test or something. I, I have to look it up every time because you keep forgetting it because you don't often do that. And then the whole end game is basically also something you read from the book because you really cannot remember all of the challenges that you have to face and how that works exactly. So there is a lot of looking up the rules in this game. And I think in the three or four times I've played this, I don't think I've ever played it 100% correctly once. There was always something that we found out that we did wrong and that wasn't the rules, but it was just not very intuitive. Some of the rules are very clear and very intuitive. I mean, the, the, the Gelflings, they move, they land somewhere, they draw a world card and they resolve it. Fine. And the Skeksis, they first draw a minion card, resolve that and then move. Or instead of moving, all the people can also rest. So fine. But the Emperor gets to draw two cards and discard one. That's something we forgot the first time as well. Well, there was just, there's more of those little rules that we kept forgetting. Like Kira can go into the Valley of Stones on her own the first time. She has to be accompanied by Jen or defeated out in the world by a world card. And then she passes out and the mystics find her. So it's, it's all nice and thematic. But geez, there's, there's just a bunch of rules that are not very intuitive. And you really have to pay attention to the rule book. Really learn it. And somebody has to keep it with them during play because you're gonna forget stuff. Now, having said that, there are also some positives to this game, and that is that if you want to play a lighter game, I mean, it is fun. It's kind of fun to just roll dice and move around and do what the cards say. It is very, very thematic. If you know the movie and if you like the movie, then you're probably going to like this game as well. It is very thematic. It, is, it has a beautiful board. I really like the, the artwork on this. The standees even are very nice. Gartham are pretty cool. The miniatures are, of course, beautiful. It would have been cool if all the standees had been miniatures as well, but, you know, you don't... You, you, well, certainly these guys, because you use these a lot. These are only in the end game, so I don't mind them being standees, but the Gartham would have been cool if that, those were actual miniatures. Then the dice are okay. I, I like that they're color-coded, so you can easily recognize what you need to roll. The components are good, I mean the, the cardboard thickness is good, the card thickness is good, the quality, all of that is, the quality of the production value here, that, that's top notch. There's just, this is good. But in the end, this is really a matter of taste. If you don't mind playing a game that's basically a luck fest with rolling lots of dice, but you enjoy the theme, you know, enough to look past that and just play it. And just see how far you can get and see if you can win the game playing as the Gelflings, which is challenging. Or you're playing the, the Skeksis and just see who of the two Skeksis will win. And if you're playing a two-player game, then, you know, you're both Skeksis if you're playing the bad guys. And you're probably going to strategize uh, that way because you're not going to attack each other. Now, even in a three- or four-player game, it I would recommend not... Uh, to avoid attacking each other until you've defeated the Gelflings. You know, somewhere around the, the end game, you're going to end up in the, thro in the Crystal Chamber anyway, and while the Gelflings are battling through the castle, you ha still have a chance to defeat each other and, and grab that scepter. Or maybe when you're seeing that they have the Crystal Shard, by that time they're moving towards the moat to enter the castle, you know, start chasing each other and grab that scepter. So. Okay, so there's not a whole lot of a difference, but when you're playing two players, then it doesn't matter which one of the Skeksis 
uh, survives because it's always going to be that one player. So to conclude, I don't know, I'm, I'm kind of bouncing on two thoughts on this one. On one hand, it's really thematic, it's nice, it's beautiful, it is kind of fun, and you know, the miniatures are great. It's the Dark Crystal. I loved the movie, and this is a game about Dark Crystal. But on the other hand, there's just no strategy. It's a dice rolling fest. The only decisions you make is do I move left or do I move right? Do I use a lower die to move instead of the full movement? Hmm. But you have to move the rolled result, and the battles are just rolling dice as well, and you're losing willpower, and in the end you have to decide, well, do I rest and gain some extra willpower, or do I retreat to the Valley of Stones, perhaps, to full, uh, to get all full uh, willpower tokens back? Do we team up or not? And that's basically all the decisions you have to make. So it's an extremely simple game in terms of strategy, because there is barely any strategy at all. So if you're the kind of person who likes playing you know, thinky games and strategy, this is not for you. If you're okay with a very light luck fest and you like the theme, well, I would say try it out. I mean, it's worth it, I think, just the production value alone. But try before you buy is my recommendation for this one. And so that was my review of Jim Henson's The Dark Crystal, the board game. Thanks for watching, I hope you enjoyed the video. Please like and subscribe, and I'll see you next time on Board Game Heaven.